But I do want to point out a potential risk, and this is a real risk, it's not simply theoretical, and that is that we need to be aware of the dreaded phytobezoar. So phytobezoar simply means a big ball of fiber, and these fiber balls or phytobezoars can cause intestinal obstruction. Risk factors for the formation of a phytobezoar include gastrointestinal surgical procedures, adhesions, and therefore, of course, we'd have to include endometriosis, diabetic gastroparesis, autonomic failure, and any other cause of GI motility disturbance, including dehydration, advanced chronology, meaning as people get older, everything tends to get a little slower, so that's what I call here advanced chronology, constipation, hypothyroidism, and some medications, of course, can also slow down gastrointestinal transit and motility. Phytobezoars can be caused by any high fiber food, especially with dehydration and or gastrointestinal motility disorders or gastrointestinal adhesions, such as following surgery, major injury, or endometriosis. Treatments for a diagnosed phytobezoar include oral hydration, enzyme therapy, surgery, endoscopy, and metoclopramide, which is a kinetic agent, and in that same vein, you might also consider erythromycin. And maybe you wouldn't believe it, but yes, Coca-Cola is one of the treatments for phytobezoars. I was quite surprised to learn that when I first read about it. But indeed, case reports have been published and even systematic reviews of the literature on the use of Coca-Cola for primary treatment of phytobezoar. It's probably the only saving grace for that beverage which is otherwise a complete waste of human productivity, transportation, and production costs. Hello everyone, Dr. Alex Vasquez here with our program on human microbiome and dysbiosis in clinical disease. This is the video series that accompanies the printed monograph. In that monograph, you also have most of the printed presentation slides, and you also have password protected access to more than 12 hours of additional video to help you understand and clinically apply this information. What I'm going to do right now is focus on what I consider to be the core highlights of the information. I'll walk you through some case reports so that we can apply that information clinically because of course the emphasis of the program is the translation of basic sciences into clinical practice. You'll find this to be particularly relevant for patients with diabetes, obesity, insulin resistance, and cardiometabolic disease. Fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, which has recently been renamed systemic exertion intolerance disease. Also, I will discuss some neuropsychiatric conditions such as autism and chronic pain and depression. And of course, major emphasis will be placed on the autoimmune and rheumatic diseases such as psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, and multiple sclerosis. This slide provides a listing of the core content, and you might also use this as a mental checklist. We start with a pretest, and that allows us to assess baseline knowledge. It also allows us to assess the overall effectiveness of this learning program. Then we have the printed monograph, and then, of course, now we are entering into the video series and the video presentations. After we've gone through the pretest, the printed monograph, and the video presentations, then we access the final exam and that gives you a chance to complete the program and print off your certificate of achievement. So again, taking our focus back to the video presentations, we're starting right now with number one, which is pathophysiologic mechanisms. I'll also talk about microbes, molecules, and morphology. So what the science shows us is that hydrogen sulfide is a mitochondrial poison very similar to cyanide, except that hydrogen sulfide is produced from microbes within the gastrointestinal tract. So we want to consider addressing this component anytime we're dealing with a patient who has what I call dysbiotic mitochondriopathy. So this is a mitochondrial disorder caused by dysbiosis because now we have evidence very clearly that these gastrointestinal bacteria can produce mitochondrial toxins. D-lactic acid is a mitochondrial toxin produced by gastrointestinal bacteria. Hydrogen sulfide is also a mitochondrial toxin produced by gastrointestinal bacteria. And I showed you earlier that endotoxin from gram-negative bacteria also produces mitochondrial dysfunction. 
So I think many of you will find interest in the fact that you can bind or neutralize hydrogen sulfide by using a specific vitamin, and I'll show you that in just a moment. Let's substantiate this concept just a little bit more before we move on to clinical applications. Microbial pathways in colonic sulfur metabolism and links with health and disease. You can see this was published in Frontiers in Physiology in November of 2012. Now we have arrived at the end of this presentation, so let's all take a deep breath, congratulate ourselves. We just talked about the microbial mechanisms, molecules, and morphology. We're now going to move on to the next video in the series, and we're going to focus on pathophysiologic responses triggered by these microbial exposures, and that will help us transition from microbes through pathophysiology and ultimately to clinical prototypes and more ways that we can manage the microbiome and dysbiotic responses in clinical practice. So I look forward to presenting that information on pathophysiologic responses that serve as the interface between the microbe and the clinical outcomes that we see in our practices. Thank you.